Hi there, Neil Clark here from Falkirk Piping, www.falkirkpiping.com Welcome to the channel. Videos contained here are designed as aid memoirs for my pupils, although they're free for anyone to use. If you are benefiting from the channel, may I ask that you consider subscribing to the channel. Please subscribe to the channel. It doesn't cost anything and there's no obligation. May I also ask that you consider supporting my chosen charity, which is Parkinson's UK, by donating to my Just Giving page. This is going to be running over several years, so there's lots of time to do this. The link to that page can be found in the comments box below this video. Welcome to lesson number 25 in our How to Learn the Bagpipe series. We have more or less progressed on to tunes now, although we will be going back to embellishments uh, as and when necessary. The tune today is Itchy Fingers. It's written by Robert Pinkman or Bobby Pinkman way back in the 80s. And it is, apart from being a very, very popular tune worldwide, it's the third most popular tune in my videos. There are 1,600 videos there at the moment of uh, talking. And uh, this is the third most often viewed. So, I've got to say before we start on it that it is not my favourite tune. Uh, the reason for that is not the tune itself. The tune itself is a fantastic tune, very popular, but it is very often really, really badly played. And in the main, badly played because people will try and play it too fast. There are four parts to this tune. We're only going to cover two parts today. The reason for that is I've actually never heard anyone play four parts, so I don't think it would be of too much use to you. The music that we're going to concern ourselves with today is taken largely from Scots Guard's Book of Standard Settings, Volume 3, purely because it's handy. Uh, I would say that the music to this doesn't change too much, but there is an alternative ending to part two, uh, which isn't the ending shown in, in the Scots Guards book and I'm going to take you through both because I think the alternative ending is actually the more common played. So we'll take you through it step by step. I will uh, offer you little tricks, little pointers which will help you to not speed this tune up uh, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. So I'll play through the thing first. the difference comes in is in the second time through part two, the last line of the second time through part two, and it occurs in bar number two of that line. I'm just going to play the second time through part number two to let you hear it, and at the end of the video I'll uh, play the whole tune with the alternative setting, which as I've said I think is actually the more common setting. So we have... through it in phrases as usual. Excuse the face fungus, this is a sort of experiment. It may or may not be on the next time I actually show my face. Usually you just see me from the neck down and uh, enough to show you the fingers on the practice chanter. Anyway, uh, the, the first phrase. Nice and slow, 
This is the phrase we're going to discuss. Okay, now everything's mega deliberate there and rigidly even. Now that's really the way that the tune should be played if you're going to play it with any form of band. Uh, it doesn't do any harm to play that your, this, uh, this way yourself in solos either and I'll explain why as we go along. We have two introductory notes. A G grace note to C and up to D. Then a doubling on E which I would like you to make as open as you possibly can to stay within the rhythm of the tune. An E strike, nice and solid, make sure you cover that hole. Up to F, a G grace note to E, A, recover with a D grace note to C, E, G grace note to F, A, D, F, and finishing with a second, very open, doubling on C. Let's play through that. Now, first of all, everything in the tune is even, not dotted and cut, very, very rigid. We don't have room to perhaps hold a note longer than it shows in the music. Everything's very, very even. To assist us to do that, and the picture that I actually have in my head is uh, of 80 upwards young pipers in a blizzard uh, in Inverness in April playing this tune and uh, that's a lot it was freezing cold some of them were very pretty much beginners and the temptation is as we've already said to run away with the tune one of the things we can do to prevent us running away from the tune is playing very very open doublings some might even describe it as extremely open doublings but it helps us play together the option that's not an option at all is to not play the doublings, that's not happening. We need the embellishment there to put the brakes on and to decorate the tune. But we must have the G grace note and the F grace note on the E as together as we possibly can in the band. And one of the simplest ways of doing that is just opening the embellishment out to what may sound an extreme stage, but it works, especially if it's a large band, nothing wrong with doing it yourself either. Let's have a look at that uh, phrase again. Okay, now things are went to extremes there because I'm demonstrating this for you. But I'm sure you get the general idea. Let's have a look at phrase number two, which begins at, at the C which is the second last note at the end of bar number two, and takes us to the B strike, uh, almost at the end of line one. Now we're going to play the B strike very open as well, and that's for exactly the same reason as our doubling in part two. But it's perhaps more important because we're at the end of the line, we're at the end of a phrase, and that's where the temptation is to just skip off that note and head up to the next phrase. Now, that really depends on the drummers, of course, but we may well leave them behind at that point. So, a ridiculously open G grace note, B strike, like this. Okay, we're actually extending that B in the middle of that quite considerably, but it will help your band stay together. So we have... Much the same from the C in bar 2, G grace note to C, up to the D, doubling on E, strike, F, G grace note to E, low A, D grace note to C, E, G grace note to C, A, G grace note to D, C, leading into our immensely heavy G grace note, B strike. Let's have a look at that and then we'll put the two phrases together.
the whole line we now have is If you're playing this tune yourself and you are confident that you will not speed up after on the B after the G grace note B strike, then by all means. What you then have to do though is you have to ensure that you actually hold that B. Um, the, the very, very open G grace note B strike is to assist perhaps a more novice type band uh, but it sounds okay, it actually sounds quite good and it goes with the drum beatings so the start of line 2 much the same in the first phrase I'm not going to go through it too much we have the introductory notes at the end of line 1 and it takes us to the E doubling at the end of line 2 part uh, bar 2 sorry And then we're ready to engage on this climb down, which is our last phrase. I'll play that first and then again explain the potential pitfalls in that phrase. So, the, 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 the difficulty again with people speeding up comes in these runs. We have two notes the same, we don't have a lot of embellishments. They are quite quick notes anyway, they're, they're semi-quavers. And of course, every, every part finishes like this. So by the time you've practised the first part, before you even move on to the second, everyone knows this phrase, and the temptation is to run through it, uh, to rush through it, sorry. Control it, all the way through. G grace note to C, up to the E. G grace note to D, C. G grace note to C, Plain B, not a D grace note as shown in the guards book, a G grace note to B, F, G grace note to E, B, very open, doubling on C, E grace note to low A, and as good a proper burrow as you can possibly manage. Something like this. It's amazing, you decide on a, a piece of music to use, thinking oh, this will be okay, it's more or less fine, and then uh, when you're working your way through, you find a, a slight mistake. So that on that uh, first B, don't put a grace note in, it's just going to get in the way. It's, I don't think it's meant to be there, I think it's a typo. So, don't slide the book, the book's okay, we all have typos. Just miss the grace note out, that's the easiest thing to do, let's have a look at that phrase again. couple of wee dangers in there other than actually rushing the music. A possibility of a crossing noise from the B up to the F. So make sure when you're at that stage of the phrase that your F is up before the B comes down. G grace note to A to finish followed by a proper burrow. I'm not going to go into proper burrows at this point. As far as I'm concerned though, there is only one way to do the burrow. Unless you're perhaps in the top 10 or 20 pipers in the world. And then you can do what you like. Down and across every time. Let's now have a look at that first part. You will repeat that first part. I'm just going to play it once through. And it doesn't alter. We're not going to offer an alternative version of this part. Places where you, uh, you you may be susceptible to crossing noises in there. I've, I've mentioned one, but be careful. Part two, however, 
is a bit of a minefield for the crossing noises. Please try and address them as soon as you hear them happen. A crossing noise is a mistake. It's not just something which you choose to fix when you're ready to fix it, or indeed if it's not that bad, you don't fix it at all. It's a mistake, it's an extra note. Uh, so please, as soon as you hear it, stop and address it. The second part, there's a lot of down and up, so or up and down. So you are going to at least have the opportunity to make crossing noises. Also, please, you're up and down all the time. Make sure when you're on the top hand that your pinky is up when you're playing a top hand main note. Let's have a look at the first time through the second part. Now, after you get the first two bars here, there's really not an awful lot to, to go over. We have the same closing bars. Line two consists of the two bars from the line one and then the same two closing bars as usual. Really just watch moving from the low hand to the high hand. You will also see in Gars Book 3 that we are shown notes with the uh, dots and cuts on them. Um, it's entirely possible to play it like that, but uh, more that, uh, often than not, it's, it's played entirely round. And that's really partly because um, most reels and hornpipes, in fact, are, play is, are played round these days. Um, but this one, let's play it round. So, second part, G grace not to C, up to E, taking care, of course, not to cross. High A, quaver, high A. A, high A, C. High A, A, high A, F, high A, D, high A, half doubling, sorry, on E, like this. Now that's very slow, very pedantic, very deliberate. I guarantee if you can play it like that, then you will play it as fast as you deem it necessary to play. It's much more difficult to play a, a, a fast tune slowly, correctly, than it is to play it quickly. Especially if you've already been playing it and you try slowing it down. Let's have a look at that again. Potential all over the place for crossing noises. If you don't make them, good on you. If you do make them, please try and address them. Just to make you aware of what we're looking at here, the first potential for the crossing noise would be the C up to E. Now everyone knows about that one. It's the classic crossing noise. We're sort of no bad after that, but we can. it's possible to cross coming from E up to high A. If the E finger is down before the high A finger comes up, we get a low A. That's an extra note, a mistake, a crossing noise. So try and make sure that your high A is up before the E finger comes down. We're then going down to low A, and up to high A. Almost impossible to make a crossing noise there. Then high A to C. You could do one there. You could bring the top hand down before the C comes up. Make sure the C is up before the top hand comes down. Back up to high A, the same thing. If the C is down before the high A comes up, you will cross there. I could go on with that, but you get the general idea. Crossing noises aren't just C to E, D to E, there's little stealthy ones come in there as well. Any little extra blips you hear, that's a crossing noise. Slow down, make sure the upper hand is up first if you're going up, and the lower hand is up if you're coming down. That's the first phrase. The second phrase is nice and easy, more of the same with the last bar of the first line of the tune joined on to the end of it. I'm not going to go through this, we've already done it. It's... Like 
with that ridiculously open B strike at the end. And of course with the B strike, I should have mentioned this, make sure that both your B and A fingers hit off the chanter together because you're looking for a low G, not an A, and hopefully not a combination of A, G, B and A. Two fingers together, down to the low G. Looking at the next phrase, uh, the next line in fact, because it consists of the first two bars of part two and the closing two bars of part one. Quite a simple tune really. Now that's the first time through part two of itchy fingers and that's more or less definite that's that's not going to change too much let's have a quick look at that and then we're going to talk about the two possible ways of playing the repeat of part two ears aren't painted on and you're particularly astute, you might have caught a crossing noise in there. I'll give you a clue, it was going up to high A. If you can identify it, please stick it in the comments box below. No prizes, but uh, it shows you're catching them. If you can catch me making a crossing noise, you can catch you making a crossing noise. Keep your, your ears open for them. So now we're going to look at the part two as shown in Scott Scar's book three. Uh, nothing wrong with it, it's just less common than uh, the, the more common version. So all we have then is the first line of part two coupled together with the second line of part one. And we're thinking tunes like Terry Bus here, that happens. You can see if you're actually using Gar's book three that there are brackets showing you where to change. If you don't have that, you're going to be changing at the end of the B strike, which is near the end of line one. I'll just show you what to do. The first way is easy enough. We'll discuss the second way after that. So, uh, that's pretty much the, the, the tune covered as far as uh, as far as Gar's Book 3 goes anyway. However, you will want to hear the, uh, the, the second way. It's a bit more exciting. It has something called a doubling strike or a shake or a pelly or whatever you decide you want to call it. And uh, much excitement going on here. My next door neighbour is a, what we call in Scotland a retained fireman, a part-time fireman. So he gets called out all the time and then drives off very fast. So he's just had a call out. So I hope every, everyone's all right. Uh, usually he's back within a couple of minutes because he gets stood down. But uh, that's the good trade-off, by the way. Uh, it can't be fun for everyone living next door to someone who teaches bagpipes. But I live next door to a fireman who gets called out at all hours of the, the day and night. So there, there's the trade-off. We, uh, we're quite happy. We like each other. So, the second time through the uh, second part here, this is what we're going to do. What we did there 
is. We're looking at the same line for repeating the second line of the second time through part number two. We, everything changes in bar number two. And I would actually expect that this is what you have written in your music. I'm guessing, because I can't find the music, but I should be able to cover it more or less accurately. So we come along then in the first bar of the repeat of part two like this. But instead of just finishing, as we've already done, we go to a D doubling strike. You can may call it a shake, you may call it a pelly. What it consists of is a G grace note on D, followed by an E grace note on D, and a full strike or a single figure, finger strike, depending on what you have in the music. Now, I would suggest the full strike, and the reason I would suggest the full strike is, first of all, the strikes we've done before are solid B strikes, so it sort of follows on, but again, it's a chance to open everything out, have a nice big deep strike, strike and make sure that the band isn't tearing off with this tune. It's another little anchor point for you. Uh, so we have... Just uh, a small amount of note changes. Doubling strike on D up to F. Sorry, high A that is. And an F and a doubling on E. We're then back on track. So. Doubling strike on D. High A. F doubling on E. And I actually think that sounds better. It breaks up the monotony if uh, a hornpipe can in fact get monotonous, if nothing else. So the second line through then, and the one I would recommend, goes like this. I also should have said at the start, but uh, if you're going to use this video again, please pause anywhere. Uh, shut me up, gives you a chance to actually practice the bits that we've went over. You can do that anywhere. Those of you with the required technical knowledge, I can't actually do this, but you can slow the videos down as well. Uh, which must mean you can speed them up too, so you can make me talk all funny or funny air if you can't get the accent. So what we'll do then is we'll finish with uh, this full tune. Uh, this time it will be the more commonly accepted uh, style. And as I said, we're not going to do uh, parts three and four. I've, I've never heard them perform. I, I might have done, but it would have been way, way back. Uh, the hornpipe itself, again, should be attributed to Robert Pinkman, Bobby Pinkman, who's still alive. Uh, so he should get a mention. And again, I've used Scott Scar's book three, a couple of little adjustments as we've carried, uh, as we've shown, really quite uh, easy, uh, not too technical tune. What the hard thing is in this is not to speed it up, and I know I've said that before. Please don't, please don't let this run away to the point where it becomes a, a noise, a collection of of notes. Uh, some people think that's good. It gives me the book. It's rotten. Just play the tune rhythmically and make it played so that it's actually identifiable as a tune. If you open up these doublings, open up the strikes, play everything nice and even, you should achieve that. Okay, so uh, here's the tune again. Happy piping. Please, once more, if you are benefiting from these videos, please consider donating to my Just Giving page which is for Parkinson's UK. The link can be found in the comments box below this video.